All righty. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Between Two Teachers. And this is where we talk about the latest issues in education uh, across the nation, up and down the state of California, and of course, locally. The issues you really need to know about, uh, some of them are you know, cautionary tales, um, and then best practices and our shout outs, try to end with some hope there. But yes, things are always happening in education and that's what we wanna share today, Monday, January 29th. My name is Consuelo Lara. And my name is Madeline Cronenberg and welcome. This is our uh, two, I think it's 218th episode of Between Two Teachers. We, we move on, we, we marshal forward. Um, and we begin uh, now, as always, we have our two uh, recognitions. The first one is the labor and body recognition, which we are have adopted. Um, uh, and it's the identical recognition that is done at the West Contra Costa Unified uh, School Board uh, meetings. So here it is written by Dr. Rochelle Rogers Art. I acknowledge that the burden of environmental exploitation and systemic injustice falls upon the labor of black and brown bodies in the building of this country and its institutions. I remember that black and brown people were born and died working this land against their will for generations. I also acknowledge the continued contribution of the labor of survivors over the centuries to today of all immigrant labor, voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples in the building of what we refer to as these United States. In addition to that recognition, we also have as our practice to share with you a land acknowledgement. And the land acknowledgement is, we pause to acknowledge that we are gathered on the ancestral territory of Hui Chin, part of the unceded land of the Chochenyo and Karkin speaking Muwekma Ohlone people. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. We offer our respect to their elders and all Ohlone people, past and present. And we encourage you, as always, to support their journey to recognition uh, by the federal government as a, a, an official tribe and so that they would be able to derive the benefits of that recognition. And you can learn more about that if you Google justice for Muwekma. And uh, also, we point you to the curriculum that has been adopted by uh, and uh, co-written with our Ohlone um, partners and is a, a curriculum, curriculum about the Ohlone contributions to the Bay Area and our history, the uh, history of the Ohlone people in the Bay Area. And that curriculum is at the East Bay uh, Regional Park District website. And it's also on the Contra Costa, College, Contra Costa County Office of Education website. Yes, on our uh, website, the, the first page uh, on about uh, CCCOE, uh, you tap that link and go down to land acknowledgement. And there's tons of resources there if you're interested in getting your own land acknowledgement and what's behind it. And, um, you know, this is so important right now at a time where people are banning all kinds of books or they're dismantling ethnic studies or they, you know, this is uh, something that's really, really important for us to keep alive and uh, to acknowledge. Um, it's just very important. Yes. Now, I, I will tell you an interesting thing. One of the first things I wanted to talk about today is an organization called NAGA, N-A-G-A. -A. And this fits into the land acknowledgement world. This organization is the Native American Guardians Association. And this organization essentially is trying to undo 
some of the efforts to uh, remove native symbolism from schools and uh, and uh, teams and and uh, other places where there is uh, uh, native imagery. And what they say is, we ask any native that supports, they consider the removal. So we've had this happen across the country where things are considered to be offensive to, uh, to the native communities have been removed, right? We've changed names of schools, we've changed names of teams. And here's the, the story it's, it's that everything has, there are two sides. So the other side now has organized itself. And they are saying, we ask any native that supports, they consider consider it eradication of our names and imagery. Would you abide by a vote of your own people or do you trust Native Americans to have a majority opinion? They are trying to say, do Native Americans, there's never been a vote of every Native American around what their position is on, what they're uh, coining as eradication of them. And they're, uh, so there's two sides to this. And they have started to undo and bring back some images that were taken away. Oh. So, you know, it is, it, it, it isn't that, to, this has been fascinating to me as I looked at that. And when I first heard the story of how a school board had revisited a decision and I thought, well, why would that be? Well, there, because somebody has organized around saying, and, and what has happened is all of the people who are at the top of the organization are, are natives. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. Native Americans. So, uh, so it's not done. There's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not over and, and, and maybe it shouldn't be, right? It's a continual conversation and exploring how different people have attached themselves to, uh, to, to the imagery of, of, uh, of their own groups, right? their own uh, identity yeah great so that's still very much happening that's still happening and that's that was a surprise to me uh i wanted to also talk about well, one of a couple of other little things uh, or not so little one of them is also in the culture wars uh there's there was a recall effort um, made uh, against uh, the uh, school board president of Temecula Valley. So throughout the country, there are people, one of the things that's happening at different school boards that have had uh, cultural issues coming up is that recalls are happening. And this is one of, this is one of them. And Temecula Valley has been uh, a very contentious, very, very contentious uh, place since they had their last election. So they're going back and forth, back and forth. And this is very much about the cultural issues that we hear about a lot. Um, and this is a, about a gentleman named Mr. Joseph Kamrowski. And his, he has obviously supporters. And then an organization called One Temecula Valley, which is now um, gathering, uh, gathering their signatures to be able to have an election to recall him. Since his election to the school board in late 2022, he and his allies spearheaded several measures that are very conservative. One resolution banned the teaching of critical race theory and another required school officials to notify parents if their child identifies as transgender. So that, those are the two key issues that are being litigated once again in Temecula Valley. And, not, and that's not the only place, but they've They've gotten, because what happens now is if you have the, the uh, recall, you have to have an election. People don't realize it gets very complicated and also very expensive. Because elections expensive. are not free. Very expensive. Yeah. People think it's free because it doesn't cost you to vote, but actually the district has to pay to run the election. Yep. Right. But, and that's not something a lot of people talk about. But uh, another one I wanted to talk about that has happened recently is out in, is in um, Indiana. And this is similar to something that happened in California in San Diego a few years ago when there was the largest uh, basically education fraud. And it was done by a, a virtual charter school. And what that school did was um, 
and make up its numbers. It inflated its student numbers to the tune of uh, being able to defraud the state of millions and millions of dollars. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You know, and, at the time of uh, declining enrollment, they're very desperate, aren't they? They're right. Desperate to. Right. And, and, and I think the other thing, the fact that because of the pandemic and people went virtual, there are many more virtual schools and opportunities that, that people are open to it in a way that they never were before. It was not a, you know, it didn't exist. So these uh, people in Indiana uh, did the exact same thing. They used that playbook and uh, created students that didn't exist. And uh, it cost, uh, they made millions and millions of dollars. So they are now, and th the thing is when you do this, if you actually get, get convicted of this, this is a felony, you go to jail. There you go. These people are going to jail. You should. Yeah, yeah. A multi-million dollar charter school indictments. This is the indictment. And they were- um, Money, right? It's coming from taxpayer money that they're defrauding. Yeah. It's absolutely. It's taxpayer money because these children, they're saying these children are in that school and they're collecting the money for educating these children who don't exist. Who don't exist. Okay. Right? But this is the thing. If you're, uh, they, one of them was convicted, the, the uh, they were indicted on uh, ah. 16 counts of wire fraud, money laundering, one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, all these uh, wow. clients. All right. So it's a very complicated, they basically received $44 million from the state of Indiana. From the state of Indiana. Jeez. To operate two online charter schools, the Indiana Virtual School and the Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy. Wow. That's sad. There it is. So anyway, that's, so that's happening. And, and that's something that people need to pay attention to because this uh, this is particular kind of fraud. People don't, you don't know what somebody is making up is happening unless somebody goes in and, and makes the claim or they realize it at the, uh, in this case, they realized it at the uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Indiana is the person that brought these, ultimately brought the charges and uh, and the indictment. Yeah, there needs to be more regulation of these things. Absolutely, absolutely, all right. And so then the last one that I wanted to talk about is Governor Newsom's budget proposal uh, about the arts. And here it is. Governor Newsom uh, is a big arts supporter, as we know. And we, under Governor Newsom, have uh, been able to uh, have Prop 28. And as we recall, when Prop 28 was passed, it uh, it gave a historic investment into arts education. And the reason that was such a big deal for the arts community is that every time throughout since 1979, since there was the, uh, the issues around uh, funding education in California after Prop 13, when those issues were created. Um, the budgets were would go up and down according to the, the um, success of the, the state budget, right? Because we get a percentage of, of the success of the state budget. So that district budgets would have to be cut if the money wasn't there at the state level. And there were certain requirements, core requirements for every district to teach. And if you weren't, the, so the things that would always get cut were the things that were not among those requirements. And first and foremost, that was always cut first, was the arts. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, they would. Yep. Always. All right. And, and so unless you were in a very affluent community, which would run an arts foundation. Yes. To, have the problem because they would simply run an arts foundation and they would supplement their public school funding. That's what they did, yeah. Which is perfectly legal. And it's not legal in all states to do that, but it is in California, mm. right? That's the California way because it's individualized. California likes the individual. Uh, so uh, they have 
we have we now have this funding stream for the arts that's specific to the arts that even when other funding streams are being limited this funding stream is still there which is an enormous complete change to how this was done before and the funding is only just starting to come in because of when it was passed and when they started to collect the money and so one of the issues a couple of issues with the funding the biggest one is that districts are being told they can't just fire their arts teachers today so they can rehire them tomorrow under the Prop 28 funding. Yeah. Which is something some places were going to do because they thought it would be a way to uh, yeah. you know, move the budget around. Difference between supplementing, which means adding to, or supplanting, which means you're taking out something and you're going to pay for it with this new money and nothing changes. It's still uh, it doesn't have the resources. So supplementing or supplanting. This has been an issue since I started teaching. I remember that, you know, for, for the categorical funds. It was absolutely an issue. And yeah. the, the whole thing with Prop 28 was that it's going to supplement, right? Yeah. Going to supplement. So there have been a lot of issues around that and, and districts are being watched and monitored for what they're doing with their arts teachers. So as people, as districts are um, are making cuts, I mean, we have overall in the state, we have declining enrollment. And that's a fact, that's right? A fact. We, have a, we have a birth rate that is lower than it used to be. So that's a fact. Um, so we have to know that in some cases, what we're gonna need are, are fewer teachers or we need to organize things differently. We also have virtual schools. We have all these different opportunities that we didn't have in the past. Um, but we've also now got the opportunity, the requirement to spend money on arts education and a funding stream to support it. Yes. So two things have happened. The uh, interesting thing is the uh, Mr. Butner, Austin Butner has created a, uh, a way to connect arts artists with, where is it? Where did I put it? With, uh, anyway, so he's connecting an app uh, with the CDE to uh, allow artists to have greater access to classrooms. So that's number one. What they wanna do is bring people into the classroom. So you could go into the classrooms as a master artist, maybe just to kind of go in and, and receive a stipend and, and um, and be there to assist a teacher. Um, or the other thing is to have a pathway to get a CTE credential in the arts. And that is the one that's come up and is interesting in that it's a, there are different ways to look at it, right? And uh, among the different ways to look at it is that a, a CTE is career technical education credential historically has never been offered for children who are eighth below the eighth grade. So there it's a it's a nine through twelve. It's a high school a secondary credential because a CTE credential doesn't require the teacher who applies for it to have a high school diploma, or certainly not to have a college diploma. Um, they have to have high school. They don't have to have college because the their work uh, compensates for that. And that's the only thing that you would historically be teaching is uh, is your your field of, of uh, expertise, whatever it may be. So that could be whether you're in the building trades, whether you were in uh, in law, whether you were in nursing, all of the folks that come in and teach in those uh, career pathways do it through a CTE credential. So rather than becoming teachers and taking the classes that one would take in college to learn pedagogy and, and classroom management techniques, they have instead this other body of knowledge. This would, if they change this credential and offer a credential for uh, younger children, uh, the issue really is how are those uh, the issues of teaching younger children addressed in that credential, right? And right now, 
apparently they're not because if it's another CTE credential, it's just simply saying that what they're doing is adding in um, their ability to teach in an elementary school as well as in a high school or maybe only in an elementary school. But the issue some folks have within the arts community is that they feel they're not being um, they're not being required to learn how to support younger children in the classroom. And they're just going to be uh, left, these teachers and those children are gonna be less supported because this credential doesn't include these additional supports for them. And there was a reason why CTE was only done nine through 12 is because there was never any question that you were gonna to have to learn how to manage a second grade classroom. Yeah, yeah. No, I. this is setting it up for failure. I just don't see that being successful. You know, it's just not going to work and it's not going to help its students. They're going to get a teacher that can only basically teach one subject. And so what about the others? And so I, I just don't see it working, you know, to be able it, to understand. The issue becomes, is it, does it, is it going, uh, are these teachers going to be successful? Yeah. Are they being set up to be successful or are they not being set up to be successful? That's that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Right. There's nothing more important than learning developmental psychology. That was the strongest thing you need to understand that children go through different levels of development. And if you don't get that, you're just not going to get kids. You're just not going to get it. Because so there's no CTE teacher who takes that. No. Yeah. You've got to know that. And you got to understand it, and uh, that's interesting. That is so interesting. So that there, there, uh, there's an effort to uh, to get them to amend it, to rethink it, to figure out. I mean, there are many ways to look at this, and also, you know, all the efforts. The great news is that there's tremendous effort into bringing uh, bringing the arts into our classrooms, and that. There, there are, uh, you know, but as you go forward and you try things, but just. Okay. Yeah, you can revisit them and, and tweak them or yeah. or uh, pilot them, and that's probably one of the things that would have to happen here is to do a pilot and see what what do you how do you envision this second grade teacher? I mean, I don't see them including oh here's a best practice where it worked. I don't hear that in this. You know, uh, no. it's important to restate that how important art is in California. The art industry or entertainment is one of the top five industries in this um, state. Right. So it is definitely a career path that needs to be taken seriously. This is true. Also, it's, you know, part of the multiple intelligences. We've had, you know, I taught at Richmond High and you could have kids that struggle reading or writing, but they are incredibly gifted in the arts. So right. that's why these things are. But here's what I think would be better. And that would be uh, making sure that the K-8 teacher knows how to integrate arts in their curriculum at all content levels. There's not right. a big emphasis on that. It's, it's a separate kind of thing. And it's really got to be integrated into everything because then that student who has that artistic ability can learn math through art or reading through music or you know, can be more creative. So the professional development, I would have liked to seen that, all of that included in this uh, in this effort. Because that must be there. That may be there somewhere, but that's not in this specific no. part of it, right? So this specific part, which is just really looking at creating, I think that the real issue that the folks that are, that, uh, that have a criticism have is that there is no other CTE credential like science, why don't you have a CTE credential for science and bring that down to kindergarten, right? You're not doing it because you know they're not gonna be, these scientists aren't gonna be able to come in. Somebody who doesn't have any training isn't going to be able to come in and be successful in the first grade classroom. Yeah, yeah. That's... Right, because what they're doing, what the, the science, the CTE scientist is coming in and, and running a physics uh, lab for a ninth grader, and that's not the same thing. As, as you say, there is this, this whole world of developmental psychology 
that you really, maybe you don't need it so much for the ninth grader, but you absolutely have to have it for the six-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that this was all done, you know, they have a positive motivation. It's the teacher shortage we're talking yes. about at the same time promoting the arts, but- And it's getting arts artists in the classroom. So there are lots of ways to get them in and there are, and, and we do want to support um, artists becoming teachers. It's just a different route to become a teacher. Yes. This, this particular route, I think that it's not inappropriate to say they could be CTE teachers as we've always had them, nine through 12. It's just, you can't just- Elementary. That there's no difference. It's got to look different. No, <laughs> that's the thing, and for them to assume it, and then, and I, and I'm thinking in my mind, why are they think? Are they visualizing? Oh, every everybody who's a dancer is like the dance teacher who runs their studio. Yes, yeah, some people would be able to do it because they run a dance studio, but they're the. That's not every dancer. That's oh. that's not everybody. I mean, you can't assume that. Uh, that they have this knowledge when you're when they don't when they haven't taken any of these courses or curriculum development pedagogy all, the, all of those kinds of things that that elementary school teachers know how to do mm -hmm. none of that is a CTE thing none of it so uh, anyway so we will follow up on this with you and let you know how things are what, how things are progressing in the world of arts education, but just know there's a lot of activity in the world of arts education right now. And, um, and it's more and more uh, important to pay attention to it. And, and the good news is that there are, you know, many more resources because of Prop 28. That really has worked. And with resources come the opportunity to make decisions and try things. So that's what we're doing. All right. And down at the county. Yeah, I've got some uh, announcements to make. This At the, our last board meeting, we had a great presentation about bullying uh, resources. There is, uh, the manager of that area is uh, uh, Day Gubir. She's in the WISP program, Wellness in the Schools, and she manages all that. And there are resources on the CCCOE website, which are really great. And uh, we heard about they have anti-suicide, they prevent suicide prevention, professional development, and they work with um, on cyberbullying, which, you know, when we did our safety uh, resolution uh, and we were doing our research, cyberbullying was really, um, it's growing. And it's connected to a lot of those uh, school shootings we saw. So to be able to understand this cyberbullying and, and address it in our schools, really important. So it was a very, very good. And we found out that there's a there's one of the members of that staff that actually works in West Contra Costa. So um, I connected him with uh, some of the teachers that that I know and some of the and actually the union. And they said that they could use it and. So that was good. I like connecting resources that we have the county with our our school district. So that was that was really great. Um, what else? We uh, OA also had um, a presentation about Proposition Twenty Eight, and it's all good things. Lots of professional development is being offered. We had a little discussion on supplant or you know a supplement. So that's we got to keep an eye on that. Everybody be vigilant and, and make sure that that money is spent on what it's meant to uh, be spent on. All right. The districts really have to understand that. And I understand the difficulty because you're in a budget crunch and yep. you see this other pot and you think, oh, I can just use that to pay those teachers. No, you can't. You can't. <laughs> you're supposed to add this pot is there to add more arts, not to yeah. pay for the arts you already have so you can afford more of something else. Yeah. So there's, you know, I mean, like our band at Richmond High, and he goes, oh, good, we can get better uniform, get better instruments, we could, you know, and then they say, well, <laughs> but hopefully I think it got, it got all, uh, you know, worked out. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, 
And then with our retired teacher group, we're moving on. It's been very um, successful and we're gonna have our, our next meeting in February. It's gonna be all on Zoom. And uh, so that's moving on, very exciting. And then uh, also we're, we talked about that uh, teacher housing issue at a retired um, uh, teachers meeting and how the human resources said, you know, if you guys got, if you can make this successful, bring us teacher housing, that's another way of recruitment. If they can pull this out and say, oh, and by the way, we have teacher housing you could recruit a lot more teachers to come and to stay. So this is, uh, this is a really important issue. We're pushing it along and helping to uh, create a roadmap and um, gathering you know, individuals who also are like-minded. And um, yeah, so it's very exciting. Um, then the other thing is about uh, teacher apprenticeship programs. Uh, so that we can increase the number of uh, teachers in our district. And Heather, we used to talk about this homegrown, having homegrown teachers. So uh, we're looking at different options there and we see this as the way to go for now uh, in recruiting teachers for our district. So that's a few things that we're working on. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for now. I heard. What, those are all great things. And, and so there is a lot of, there's always a lot going on. It's a big industry. Education is a big industry. And um, uh, and we could just continue to update you on what we see that's happening as, as uh, time goes by. Uh, one thing I just wanted to finish with as a, a shout out for is something I saw last week when I was watching the Richmond City Council meeting. And there was a presentation by two students from El Cerrito High, two uh, uh, Nabila Sher Oliver and Arwa Asif. And they presented an uh, uh, opportunity for people to understand the need for a social host ordinance. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. it's an unusual term, right? It, it exists in a number of places, but, but basically what it is, is an ordinance that says if you, uh, it's, it's to uh, control underage drinking and to say that if you are guilty of serving alcohol to people who are underage, you could be arrested. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's basically it. And this ordinance exists in a number of uh, places and, 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 and there are lots of, of uh, it's also a complicated issue. How does it work with the police departments? What exactly happens? Who uh, instigates uh, uh, the call? Uh, many things about it. But the, the big shout out is, and, and it wasn't absolutely adopted. They're gonna have to come back with more information to decide whether or not this is something that the city of Richmond is gonna go forward with because the students and, and the um, coalition uh, group that were there with them um, what needed to, to bring some uh, information back from the police department because they're the ones that have to implement it. So you really do need to talk to them and see what they're, uh, what their thinking is about about the ordinance and to see how, get more information about how specifically it works in the other communities where it has been implemented. But the big shout out is to the students who went to the Richmond City Council with their slide deck and presented it. Wonderful, wonderful. That's always good to see advocacy from our young people. Yeah. It totally is. I was, and uh, it was just, uh, and what they got to see is, is the process, that there is process here, you know, and we all know this, people come up with all the ideas that we talk about here, and you've got to work with them until you find the, the way to put it that you can move it forward, or whether or not maybe it's not time to move it forward, or there's another path altogether that you want to take. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Shout out to them. Shout out to them, to the folks, everybody involved in the social host ordinance proposal for the city of Richmond. And I hope that and I, I really am thrilled that they brought the issue up. And it's something that they have been working on for years. They had done a survey at, at uh, different farmers markets and other places, uh, actually before the pandemic. 
So this is a group of people that really want to address uh, underage drinking. Great. All right. That's it. So that's it for, for now. Uh, we'll see you guys all next week. On episode, next week, it'll be episode 219. <laughs> we'll see you next time on Between Two Teachers. Bye now.